Hello, I'm Faye Kwan and you're watching It's About Youth, where today we'll be speaking about urban planning and Malaysia's public transportation system, as well as where the younger generations stand in the midst of it. Now, it's estimated that um, half of the world's population, that's 4 billion people, are currently living in cities. By 2030, the UN Habitat estimates that over 60% of uh, urban city dwellers will be those aged under 18. So it only seems natural to include the youth voice when it comes to conversations about urban planning and development. So to discuss this further, I have with me Azif Azudin, uh, an urban mobility researcher, as well as Nabil Irshad, a member of Transit Malaysia. Thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Now, to start off, um, if we look at Malaysia itself, within the Klang Valley, home to about 8 million of our population. Um, we are served with several rail lines, the MRT, the LRT and the KTM, for example. Um, but despite having these rail lines in place, traffic congestion uh, remains a persistent issue. Um, as if maybe you could break this down for us, um, with traffic data showing that road congestions are, have gotten worse in Kuala Lumpur after um, than it was before the pandemic. Um, what has influenced our dependent, heavy dependency on cars in the first place? Right. So I think we have to look back in the 80s um, where we can boil it down to three, dif three, di three factors that contributed to us being a very car dependent nation. Mm -hmm. The first is the national vision that we had to produce our first car. And in so we started developing a manufacturing um, industry to develop prot Proton, right? The second would be in order to support Proton as a car industry with car policies, you have to ov obviously also introduce policies, whether it's labor, uh, whether it's urban planning or road planning, these policies have to be very pro-car as well in order to support uh, that business. And finally, of course, we have the final piece of the puzzle, which is uh, energy subsidies, right, in the form of petroleum. Mm -hmm. So when you combine cheap fuel with protectionist policies that that encourages people to buy local cars, such as Proton in the 80s, uh, and of course policies that uh, allow you to build lots of highways, lots of roads. You have a nation that is um, that is geared, or let's say encouraged towards car ownership. Mm -hmm. So if, even if you look at how highways are developed in Klang Valley over the past 40 years, right? In the 90s and the 2000s, you see a majority of Klang Valley highways being developed and completed and open to the public at that time. So. We have to also remember that the development of highways is to support more car use, right? So when you think about all these different factors that have occurred over the past 40 years, it's not surprising that we are a very car dependent nation because our policies, because the entire ecosystem encourages you to adopt car or lose out. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, that's on cars, but then Nabil, when we, from based on your observations, then what's really discouraging Malaysians from using more public transport? Um, for me, based on my observation and my personal experience, I would nail it down to three um, reasons. Firstly, accessibility. Second, reliability. And third, as if touched upon this, is um, car incentivized policies. So when you talk about accessibility, just think about how, or maybe you yourself or myself, like how hard is it for you to get to the closest public transport infrastructure there? Does it take you long to walk there? Mm -hmm. and for a lot of Malaysians and a lot of people, they feel like it is not convenient enough for them to walk there. It's not accessible. They have to walk an extra 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And on top of that, they have to transfer trains. Yep. And that will cause them another 5 minutes, 10 minutes walk. So that's not on the accessibility part. <laughs> and second, reliability. Um, what's important in public transportation is, can I get where I want to go, where, where, where I want to go, when I want to go? So. If the train is not predictable, you don't know there's a schedule, but it doesn't follow it, or there's a bus that they don't follow that schedule, it's no longer predictable. So you can't really go to where you want to go, when you want to go. Mm -hmm. And the second is maybe the frequency itself. Maybe if, if you can see right now, um, a lot of the uh, Klang Valley train lines, the frequency is like 6 to 10 minutes, but sometimes there are breakdowns, unplanned breakdowns that are not well communicated. That will impact the reliability and the views of the consumer. And when that happens to a consumer once, a user once, and if they're not a regular user, in the end, they will plan to get a car because they don't feel it is reliable. So that's the second point. And the third is, like, as if touch upon it, is the many car 
centric policies that encourage you to get a car instead of using public transport because all these policies will just push users to eventually get a car. They'll only use public transport for as long as they cannot afford a car. But the moment that they can buy a car, the moment that they can afford to maintain a car, they will get a car instead of using public transport. So those are the three key um, main observations that I can see um, why urbanites or Klang Valley users or any people in the cities in Malaysia don't use public transportation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think as Azif pointed out, it started since the 80s, so it's really decades in the making of where we are mm -hmm. now. Um, but going back to your first point on accessibility, uh, one thing that's always brought up is the first and last mile connectivity. Like you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, how you know people walking from their homes to the train station in the first place is already a barrier. Uh, Azif, what do you make of the, our current first to last mile infrastructure and how has it affected um, the average Malaysian? Well, truth be told, our first and last mile infrastructure is very underserved. Mm. Um, earlier, we talked about how we have very car centric policies and this also goes into urban planning, right? So take, for example, we go to a neighborhood, any neighborhood in Malaysia, especially private developer neighborhoods. You will see that the roads designed for cars are much more better maintained and if it's not better maintained it's given more priority over pedestrian uh, pedestrian access right mm -hmm. pedestrian walkways um, so you have to ask ourselves is it safe for us to use uh, the pedestrian walkway in order to get to the bus in order to get to mm -hmm. the commercial center maybe which is a five minute walk but it doesn't become a five minute walk it becomes a 10 minute walk because you have to contend against uh, this the non-safety of walking with cars for example or maybe the walkway being broken for example, right, or if you're a disabled uh, person, it becomes even more difficult for you because the pedestrian access is so difficult. And in this sense, this isn't just, um, this is a problem that you see throughout different towns in Malaysia, different townships, different neighborhoods, pretty much the entire of Malaysia because our urban centric policies are very car oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, so first mile, last mile access, as Nabi mentioned earlier, is very difficult. Um, and who would want to walk on the side or on the pedestrian walkway if it's not a great experience? Because at the end of the day, first mile, last mile experience is also dictated by how you experience mm -hmm. it, right? If the walk to your bus stop is very difficult, if it's very uh, unpleasant, or you have to wait in the heat, uh, for example, or in the rain, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to do it the next time. Yep. You would rather get another car. Uh, maybe you pay a bit more to be in a car, but at the very least, you're protected. You can get to point A to point B with some relative protected from, uh, protection from the elements. And it really comes down to choice and how that choice is dictated by experience. And given how our first mile, last mile infrastructure right now is very, um, I would say, not up to scratch, not up to standard, the car becomes the default choice because it's much better in, that, in, the, term, in the terms of experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think many can resonate with you when you talk about the issues of even walking, not, no proper sidewalks and uh, no mm -hmm. shade with the hot sun or the rain and the unpredictable weather these days yeah. due to climate change. Uh, but moving on um, now as we head towards GE15, and many major coalitions have released their manifestos. I'd like to highlight a few points um, when we're talking about this in this topic. Uh, when it comes to micromobility, Pakatan Harapan has vowed to push for regulation and uh, legislation around e-scooters and bikes. Uh, and another one, Perikatan National, talking about public transport. They've vowed to improve uh, our public transport uh, system to better link the urban areas with the rural areas. Uh, what do you guys think of this? Nabil, do you think this is something that the younger generation want and need? Well, when it comes to micromobility, as you touch on um, the PH, uh, PHS manifesto, I think it only makes so much sense to regulate micromobility and to provide the proper infrastructure and the framework of how to operate it because at the moment it is a niche product yeah. like the only people who would use it right now are mostly youths to be mm -hmm. fair but the when the government banned put a blanket ban on micro mobility products earlier this year i feel that as a very short term very reactive um, policy that they implemented because they were afraid that what it might cause in terms of safety and so on but it is a very short-sighted policy I feel that regulation is actually what the e micro mobility operators want mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the users want because they want to know okay what can I do uh, to make this experience safe and pleasant and what can I expect from the government to support my um, this new product here so I only think that it would definitely capture the attention of youths because it provides them with an alternative form of transportation 
also it's kind of fun. <laughs> it's yeah. a very funny um, um, equipment for transportation because mm -hmm. personally, I have a, an e-scooter myself. Yeah. I bought it earlier this year. But when they ban put a blanket ban on it, I stopped using it entirely because I did not know when can I use it, where can I use it, will I be fine because of this. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, I actually wanted regulation. I wanted to know um, clearly where can I use my scooter safely and will there be a plan to provide the right infrastructure uh, where it be like um, bike lanes that I can ride on, parking for micro mobility products or where can I take it on the train or in the malls and so on. Those kind of frameworks that I was mm -hmm. looking for. But instead what I got was a blanket ban on it, yeah. which is very unfortunate. So I really like that they are looking into proper regulation and I hope they work with the micro mobility providers and the micro mobility users because it is a form, it's not Personally, I don't think it's the best solution for the first mile, last mile. It is a solution, yeah. but it, yeah, it is a solution that is worth looking into. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so that's my. I think I like how you point out that it's it's more regulations for you to be able not only to be able to use it, but to use it safely. You know, that really exactly, shows yeah. the yeah. need for better infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, yeah. when it comes to this, right? Uh, as if, uh, what do you think? Would these the manifestos outlined so far? Do, would these pledges resonate with the youths or urban citizens in general? Right, so we exa if we examine each major coalition's manifesto, Pakatan Harapan's manifesto is the only one that talks about micro-mobility. Mm -hmm. But I think even that is lacking because, as we mentioned earlier, <coughs> public transportation or even urban transportation generally is an ecosystem that you have to think of. Mm -hmm. Micro-mobility, first mile, last mile, uh, is just one part of the ecosystem. And if you only address that you're going to loosen regulations, you also have to talk about what Nabil has been talking about earlier, which is great, right? He's talking about, is it safe for me to take my e-scooter or my bike on the road? Then now you're talking about infrastructure. Now you're talking about urban planning and the urban fabric. Mm -hmm. There are no policies outlined by any of the major coalitions about dealing with urban planning or urban mm -hmm. or dealing with the urban fabric, right? How do you make cities walkable, livable, accessible to everyone, right? Um, and I think this is the uh, short-sightedness or maybe parts of the coalition in thinking that the youth or maybe people in general want micro-mobility, let's give it to them without thinking further ahead. What is it for? Yeah, what is it for? Mm. Or how do we shape the environment to make it conducive for micro-mobility players? Mm -hmm. For example, um, Beam is a major player in the micro-mobility uh, ecosystem right now in Malaysia. And you see their scooters everywhere, but you can't exactly ride their scooters everywhere safely, mm. right? Because yeah. now you're comp when you ride in some places in Kuala Lumpur, for example, you're competing against cars, motorcycles, uh, and you're in danger of being hurt, not the car user, not the motorcycle user, you, because you have very minimal protection. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the core of why the Ministry of Transport uh, decided to do the reactionary blanket ban, uh, blanket ban. Mm -hmm. but at the same time, the consideration for it being part of a larger ecosystem is missing. And I don't mm. think anyone's addressed the fact that you need to change how cities look. Yeah. You need to change how people interact with their, with their urban fabric in order to make the first mile, last mile ecosystem conducive, not for cars, but for people. Because mm -hmm. it's people that are using the roads. Mm -hmm. It's people who are walking on the roads, taking bikes, taking micro-mobility uh, items, not cars. Mm -hmm. And there's a need for more long-sighted um, policies, essentially. Uh, things that consider not just in the short term, but in the long term and how it will affect us all. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not just long-sighted, I feel, but more comprehensive and interconnected. Because uh, as mm. I've said, the policies, for example, PH, even though PH has the most relatively in-depth um, manifesto when it comes to public transport with the 10,000 buses or, and yeah. so on, I think, there's little connect uh, synergy, let's put it that way, with the other policies. Like, will they're, they're still going to encourage, like, um, cheaper tolls, for example, yeah. and that kind of contradicts the idea of public transportation and so on. So there, there needs to be coordination between all within the whole ecosystem, as Azif puts yeah. it, in order to get public transportation to really work in Malaysia. You can't mm -hmm. just focus on one thing in public transportation, but in urban planning, you look at another. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which okay. comes to the point, right? When it comes to the vision or at least policy goal that the government wants to have, when it comes to urban transportation, you have to focus. Do you want what is the policy goal? Do you want to increase public transport usage, or do you want increase? Do you want people to have a more reliable or maybe more accessible form of transportation, mm -hmm. or do you want people to be in cars? These yep. two are in conflict with each other, and the gov not government lah, but basically, all coalitions seem to not be able to grasp that you can't have both. Mm -hmm. yep. You can't have your cake and eat it. You can't encourage people to to use cars, 
but at the same time tell them to use public transport which one is which mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's contradicting is contradicting yeah you need to focus on one goal as many other countries and cities have and stick to it mm-hmm. and then create an ecosystem that encourages steps towards that and define goal mm-hmm. okay well more on that later <laughs> but before let's hit for a quick break stay with us Welcome back to It's About Youth, where today we're speaking about urban planning and Malaysia's public transportation system, together with Azif Azudin, an urban mobility researcher, as well as Nabil Irshad, a member of Transit Malaysia. Now, previously, we talked about their take on the state of Malaysia's public transportation system and how major coalitions' manifestos leading up to GE15, how their manifestos are um, matching up to their expectations uh, in terms of addressing the current issues that we are facing. Uh, but moving forward, uh, Nabil, over time, we touched about this a little bit uh, in the first section, but over time we've seen governments offer things such as reducing toll rates and uh, free public transport initiatives. But what do you make of this? Do you think um, these sort of uh, initiatives are sufficient or do you think these funds can be channeled into something else? Yeah, like we touched on uh, just before, like how it's very contradictory when you give up free free toll, uh, free public transport, but also you want to reduce the toll rates. Yeah. They're very, they're not. You can't have both. Either you get people in cars or you get people in public transportation. So, I feel that the funds, um, besides besides that, the funds could are not part of a larger plan. They're just one-off things that they do because oh, there's a problem here. Let's just put the short term fix and let's hope it works. Mm-hmm. It might work in the short term because I did notice there was a s- slight spike in the usage of public transport when they made it free for a whole month. Yep. But after that, what happens? People start going back into their cars because they realize that the trains are not frequent, that mm-hmm. the trains break down, the buses don't come, and so on. So they had a taste of it, but the t- what they tasted wasn't great. <laughs> so the funds could have been. What I would like as um, a regular user of public transportation is that funds to be part of a larger plan to improve the public transportation infrastructure in Malaysia. And it should be, um, there should be a very clear plan of separating the capex and the opex of public transportation mm. uh, development. Because right at the moment, Malaysia, I feel, is very capex heavy. For example, we'll build massive MRTs that cost like hundreds of billions of ringgit. But right now, the frequency is like half of its rated frequency. Yeah. For example, at peak hours now is six minutes. Instead of the rated, it is capable of going for two minutes frequency. But right now, it's only six minutes because trains are not maintained. They could not operate it. They don't have the opex to keep it at that way. So those funds could have been planned better um, in order to maintain those trains, maintain those buses, provide bus drivers with better salaries, mm-hmm. and so on. So. I feel like yeah, the funds should be part of a larger plan, uh, a clearer plan um, to improve public transport in general rather than one-off gifts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you talked about how uh, we tend to focus on like big infrastructure projects, you know, mm. the MRTs, and then we don't really look at the maintenance mm. and follow up on it. But another big infrastructure project that our politicians tend to look at is building new highways, which we know is not necessarily the solution to traffic congestion. Uh, as if, uh, what do you think, what should our next elected government look into to improve accessibility, mobility, and uh, to a certain extent, transparency? Yeah, and I think this comes back to what I mentioned about earlier, which is to have a very clearly defined goal mm-hmm. regarding urban mobility. What is it that you want? Do you want people to go into buses and trains or use micro-mobility, or do you want people to go into cars? Deciding on that urban mobility goal will shape the directions and the goals and policies that you have in place to support that ecosystem, right? Mm-hmm. But right now, what we are seeing is that a lot of these goals are very contradictory or they're very car-driven. And for me, I think what we should have first and what I hope the next government can do is to really consider public transport not just as a single issue to look at, uh, throw money at it and hope it fixes itself, it doesn't work that way, Mm -hmm. is to look at what are the corresponding ecosystems, uh, what are corresponding factors in the ecosystem that 
contribute to public transportation, right? We talked earlier about walking mm -hmm. to buses. That's part of the urban fabric. That's part of urban planning. You plan for roads or uh, pedestrian walk paths that are conducive, that allow you to walk to buses, that walk to train stations. So you need to think about public transport being part of a larger ecosystem, part of urban planning, uh, part of how you, 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 do, you do land use. Where do you locate homes close to offices, for example, homes close to uh, industries or recreational areas. A lot of that is down to land use, which is another aspect of urban planning. Mm -hmm. But what I hope the next government does really is to think about how do I encourage public transport use and what are the supporting factors that move towards the direction? Do I need to plan cities better? Do I need to introduce policies that encourage it, such as the free fares are great. Uh, they are a booster for people to join up to, to want to try out public transport and hopefully hook them on. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like Navi mentioned earlier, so much is given to giving the initial boost into CAPEX to developing large infrastructures, but not, is enough, to, not enough is given to, for the maintenance and for the expansion of the public transport network to support and encourage people to get on it more. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and that boils down to priority, right? Is it revenue driven or is it seeing public transport as a public good, which means mm -hmm. we fund it? We know it's going to operate at a loss, but the, yeah, but the public good really is that people get access to jobs, people mm -hmm. get access to schools, people mm -hmm. are able to socialize, go from one place to another at a very affordable cost. Mm -hmm. I like how you point out really, um, it's not just maintaining public transport, but other factors come into play as well. Housing, for example, mm -hmm. and where, um, how people can access public transport in the first place. But when we talk about um, all, all these things, um, you know, the users public transport users outside the Klang Valley are often left out of the conversation. So I'd like to touch on it a bit. Um, now, Bill, what do you think the next elected government should focus on when it comes to those in rural areas? Okay, first, um, well, as if I mean both pointed out that there needs to be a choice between getting people into cars or getting people into public yeah, transport. That's the point we're driving home. But there is actually a, there's only one objective correct choice, in my opinion, mm -hmm. which is public transportation, because forcing people into cars is ju just not sustainable. But at the moment, the default view and the, the default view of the government and generally the people already today is that everyone needs a car. That is their main choice of transportation. And everything else is just an alternative. Mm -hmm. This needs to change. It has to be up. There needs to be an idea, upheaval in the idea where transportation m must prioritize walking, micro mobility, and then public transportation, and the car is the last alternative. Okay, once we have that idea, that, that belief, that goal that we want to set out, um, to encourage or to develop public transportation outside of Klang Valley, there needs to be a fair distribution of the funding no discrimination between the different states mm -hmm. and also the establishment of regional authorities that are empowered to develop their own public transport infrastructure. For example, right now, we don't really have that in KL and anywhere in Malaysia. Right mm -hmm. now, it's just top down from MOT. They tell you what to do. They tell Prasarana what to do and they just govern generally what you, you can do. And for example, maybe Selangor itself has some local initiatives, but there's no planning agency or authority that's going to like look at the bigger picture on how to develop public transport. So a good first step is to establish regional authorities in our major urban me metropolitans like mm -hmm. Klang Valley has its own regional authority, Penang has its own regional authority and Johor Bahru has its own regional authority and they will look at the bigger picture on how to move forward pushing public transport as the main transportation um, mode for its residences. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Although in this sense, I think I would, uh, I would take a slightly more nuanced view when looking at rural areas. Mm -hmm. We yes. talked earlier about urban planning and yeah. the urban fabric. In rural areas, everything is far apart from each other, right? And the only mode of transport left for you to use, which is affordable in some sense of the word, is actually using your motorcycle mm -hmm. and using your car. I've used buses before in different parts of Malaysia, rural Malaysia, for example, right, in the East Coast. And people who usually take the buses are those traveling from maybe uh, the major towns to another major town for work purposes. But mostly people prefer to use cars and motorcycles. And in that sense, I think um, the treatment uh, should be a little bit more different as, well, as what Nabi mentioned earlier. You need a regional authority that knows the localized mm. context better so that does this place need more, does this place need a train, for example, right? We are talking about Kuantan that uh, I think earlier this year mentioned that they want to establish a rail line in, uh, in Kuantan. Mm -hmm. But is that necessary based on what they know about the local context and what the local needs are? Um, and if different cities do it differently, 
there is no consistency across the board. And I think we need a consistency, like Nell mentioned, in the form of a regional authority that can manage and see how the different regions, the different townships, different states can synergize and have a plan, a single plan moving forward. Mm -hmm. Whether it's to encourage, I don't know, public transport use or maybe to accommodate a little bit more to motorcycle use and transferring them into buses instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So getting everyone in on it really, not just top down like you mm -hmm. mentioned, Nabil. Uh, but in your opinion then, do you think, should we be including more of the younger generation when it comes to uh, development planning processes and what's the value of it? Oh definitely, because like as if told a long, no, 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 sorry, like a story of how <laughs> the car centric policies were not one day it just happened, it was um, long term across decades from the 80s until today. So it's difficult to be honest to onboard a lot of the older generation to be fair because they grew up with it. Mm -hmm. They view the car as the ideal path to development and to wealth in a sense because that was the vi vision in the 80s, right. in the 90s and so on. That's why we really push for car centric policies. Whereas the youth are a lot more malleable. Our views are still open, kind of open to ideas, to alternatives. And we have a better, we, we realize that we will be dealing this with in, in the future. We will be de dealing with climate change in the future because transportation is the key, uh, one of the key factors um, mm -hmm. in climate change. So I believe the youths need to be consulted need to be onboarded on how we move forward with transportation in general. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Especially because this is going to affect them in exactly. decades to come. Yes. Uh, so in ensuring uh, that we have proper public transport and accessibility, getting regional authorities involved, all of this is vital mm -hmm. to making our cities and our towns more livable and also more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Well, that, thank you so much for joining me okay. today. I've been speaking to Azif Azuddin as well as Nabil Irshad. Uh, GE15 will take place on November 19th. So be sure to head out and exercise your right to vote. Uh, thank you for watching It's About Youth. I'm Faye Kwan. See you next time.